What I'll be telling you about is making quantum states of light uh, with moving mirrors. Uh, and also, so I am from JILA, which is a joint institute from, uh, between NIST and the University of Colorado on the University of Colorado campus. Uh, NIST is the National Institute of Standards and Technology, uh, which has a little bit of a measurement flavor. Uh, so hence, when I throw measurement into this talk a little bit, uh, that's sort of where that's coming from. All right. so. I want to thank the Simons Foundation for putting together this lecture series on the third quantum revolution and also for sort of the compelling way that they have um, phrased this lecture series in that it really starts from the idea of the invention of quantum mechanics, uh, the second quantum revolution being entanglement. And then as we look towards the third quantum revolution, what we're looking at is putting together uh, many qubits uh, and thinking about quantum algorithms uh, to really uh, get to the potential of large scale quantum systems. And I think in some of the other uh, lectures in this series, uh, it's been discussed sort of what are the impacts on uh, foundations of computer science uh, that, for example, a universal quantum computer would have. Uh, but there are also sort of many layers of quantum systems from, from other perspectives of, as well. And maybe some of the things that you'll get out of this, this lecture are also looking into what are ways that we can use quantum resources for better sensing or for better measurement? Uh, how can we network uh, different quantum systems together? And one of the things that I like to keep in mind or that I sort of believe is that in many contexts right now, sort of the book of quantum hardware uh, is not yet fully written. Um, from the perspective of making a universal quantum computer, um, there's, for example, many different uh, qubits that people are, are pursuing and the sort of the community is sort of I think voted by their actions um, that there's sort of five different platforms, even in industrial settings that people are looking at. Uh, so it's really quite unclear at this point uh, what's going to be most fruitful and also sort of what kinds of supporting technologies uh, will we need in the context of the quantum systems that we would like to build. Uh, so in that spirit uh, today, I'm going to talk about what I think of as sort of a very niche quantum system at this point, uh, and sort of the, the history of some of the work that we've done uh, to bring these type of systems to the quantum regime. Uh, so I'm going to start out uh, by showing you just sort of a picture of the type of thing that we work with in our lab in the context of these mechanical quantum systems. Uh, and so I called it a moving mirror in the context of uh, the title of this talk. And what it is is a little uh, tiny piece of dielectric uh, that's sort of stretched across a silicon frame. Uh, and the material is silicon nitride, and it forms a drum-like structure that we call a membrane. So I'll refer to membranes a lot in this talk. It's about a millimeter by a millimeter size. So if you were to take this little chip and hold it side to side, you can see it reflecting. Uh, so you can see it um, with your eye. Uh, it's about 50 nanometers thick, and it's about a mass of, of 10 nanograms. Uh, and for the purpose of this talk, you can really just think of this thing uh, as a mass on a spring. Uh, it is an elastic deformation of uh, many atoms, but it's really just that single degree of freedom of the mass on the, on the spring. Uh, and for uh, many, in many ways, as an isolated object, um, you could think of this as a quantum harmonic oscillator uh, with an oscillator frequency, uh, omega, as I've shown here. Okay, so uh, with that introduction, let me bring you a little bit back to uh, the history of this idea uh, that we're going to take these mechanical objects and we're going to turn them into a quantum field of research. And this started, you know, some decades ago, actually, where people were sort of on a quest um, to take uh, micro and nano mechanical objects, uh, sort of things that have been engineered and fabricated in the context of microelectromechanical systems, MEMS, uh, and ask if they could uh, bring them to the ground state of that harmonic oscillator. Could they get rid of thermal excitations of the object um, so that there was some chance um, that they could act as a, a quantum degree of freedom? And there's sort of uh, two different cases that you might um, consider that people were looking at. Uh, one is the one over here, uh, where this is a tiny, tiny fleck of, uh, of metal uh, that vibrates at 10 gigahertz. And there are probably 
many things around us that are vibrating at 10 gigahertz, but uh, what they're able to do is measure uh, this object very well. Uh, and then if they put it in the bottom of a dilution refrigerator so that they could do cryogenic cooling, um, then they found that this object um, could be something uh, that they could play with in the quantum space. Uh, on the other hand, people are also looking at um, things like AFM cantilevers, uh, like the picture that's over uh, on the other side here. Uh, these are at much lower frequency, so their oscillator energy is much lower. Um, so even if you cool them to a dilution refrigerator, um, you aren't necessarily going to occupy um, one stage of their motion. Uh, but nonetheless, you can sort of couple them to light um, faster than they're coupled uh, to their environment and use ideas that are sort of akin to laser cooling of atoms. Um, so I'm actually sort of an atomic and optical physicist by training. Uh, and so this is what we, got me excited about this field, is that we could push on uh, cantilevers like this uh, with lasers and cool them in a very similar way uh, to the way that we take atom or ion quantum bits uh, and cool them with lasers as well. Uh, and so we're really pushing on these things with radiation pressure. With the other ingredient being uh, that they really have to be very isolated from their solid state environment. There's some sort of one particular mode that you pick out um, that has a very high quality factor. That is, it keeps its acoustic energy uh, for a very long uh, amount of time. And there's a lot of engineering uh, that goes into thinking about how you can do that. Uh, so it, sort of around you know, the 2010s or so, it piqued um, people's interest in sort of uh, getting to this regime. Uh, and you know, to give you one flavor of different ways that, that people were approaching this type of problem uh, and a little physicality to this situation, uh, if you imagine any of these objects being masses on springs, uh, the way that you uh, imagine doing laser cooling is you can actually put some light in an optical bottle. Uh, and then that light in uh, this cavity or bottle um, will push on that object with radiation pressure. And if you push uh, at the right uh, time, okay, uh, in the right direction, um, you can actually damp and cool the motion of this object. And the way that I think about that is I put in my laser light, um, actually uh, red detuned of a cavity response function. I can enhance an anti-Stokes process over a Stokes process. Uh, and I can also tell how close I am to the ground state of this oscillator by comparing um, those two transitions. Uh, so in this way, I, I can actually think about this, this type of laser cooling. Uh, with a variety of the objects, mostly um, high frequency objects, uh, people are really now in a domain um, where we're doing genuine quantum mechanics, right? Quantum mechanics is what we all talk about, um, but this is real mechanics. Um, so people can count individual phonons using superconducting qubits. So there's a very important N there. Um, so photons are individual particles of light. Um, phonons are these excitations of the harmonic oscillator of these mechanical objects. Uh, they can put phonons in superposition states uh, and map their quantum states um, with the following uh, diagrams that I'm showing here. And you can do remote entanglement and even um, show ben Bell's inequalities uh, with phonons. Uh, so these are some of the exciting things uh, that have been going on uh, with controlling mechanical excitations with light. Uh, and this has all been, um, all of this sort of in the last uh, couple of years. Uh, so in the context of this talk, uh, I'd sort of like to switch this on its head a little bit. I've talked a little bit about using light to control mechanics, um, but I can actually think about the same process as a really a way where mechanical motion, once I get it into this regime where these thermal excitations are small, uh, can manipulate light. Uh, and so I'm going to try to come at this from a sort of uh, in interferometry and quantum measurement history. I feel like that's a way to make it a little bit more physical. And I'll talk about making squeezed light uh, with moving mirrors, where squeezed light to a quantum physicist is a little bit of a boring quantum state. Um, but nonetheless, it's a, it's a really good example, and it's a good way to uh, improve uh, sensing with quantum states. Uh, and then I'll talk about some of our more recent work, uh, where what we're trying to do is take superconducting quantum bits couple them to these mechanical objects, uh, couple light also to those mechanical objects, and hence make a way that I could take a superconducting qubit single photon and translate it to optical light, uh, which is one of those tricky problems um, in the context of quantum systems right now. Uh, so in that way, sort of moving towards more interesting quantum states. Okay. 
All right, and at the end of the talk, if we have time, I didn't want to spend uh, too much time telling you about uh, one of my favorite subjects, which is making cool mechanical objects. Uh, but this is uh, one of the things that we do to try to isolate these uh, objects from the environment more and more, is that we put them in structures that make an acoustic band gap. Uh, and we can do this in a variety of ways, and these are just some uh, teaser images and objects that we make vibrate uh, and that we isolate more and more. So we'll talk about that at the end, uh, but at the moment we'll just think about these as masses on springs that we happen to have one mode that we can talk to as well as we want. Okay, uh, so with that, uh, I'm going to step back um, and sort of start with a story that, that hopefully everyone can, can relate to, um, related to measuring the uh, motion of a mechanical object. This isn't exactly the uh, type of setup we use in our lab, uh, but it'll sort of move towards um, what we can do uh, and towards these uh, transducers between microwave and optical photons. Uh, so I'll start here by talking about a Michelson interferometer, um, which probably most people are familiar with in the context of their uh, sort of freshman physics course, lab course. Uh, so what you do is you have a laser, um, you split it with a beam splitter here, uh, it goes along two paths, and then you uh, look at the light uh, down here on a photo detector. Okay, and if you look at the output photo current as a function of the path length difference between those two paths that are shown there, uh, you get a fringe pattern. Uh, and if you sit on the side of one of these fringes, uh, the side meaning uh, something right here, I'm not sure this is enough of a small blob to point to the side, uh, but if you sit on the side of the fringe, um, you're able to uh, determine uh, the position of one of these mirrors uh, compared to uh, one of the, the other mirror on the other arm. Okay, and uh, this is sort of a common measurement tool for every day, like your uh, freshman lab course, or heroic tasks like uh, LIGO, for example. And if you have a situation where you're sort of, um, you know, in your freshman physics lab and you're neighbor is pounding on the lab table, right? That's one way that you get uh, some vibrations that you don't want while you're sitting on the side of that fringe. Um, if you got rid of that, uh, maybe there would be seismic noise um, that's affecting your ability to, to know fundamental things about uh, this, uh, this mirror uh, that might, you might be looking at. Um, if you got rid of that, um, you might be concerned about the thermal or Brownian motion uh, of that mirror. So that will actually aff affect um, your ability to measure some force, say, on the mirror. Uh, and if you got rid of that, you cooled it way down, uh, one of the things you may be limited by is actually your, your measurement apparatus, uh, the laser light that you're using, uh, the shot noise, the Poisson distributed photons of the optical field that you're using to measure. Okay. And, you know, sort of in the history of interferometry and precision interferometry in this context, uh, there came a time where people were also thinking about, well, let's say I put a lot of power in this interferometer, um, sort of kilowatts in the arms, and then you can no longer think about the interferometer as some immutable structure that it's sitting there, um, but actually the light pressure on the mirrors would become important, so the radiation and pressure. Um, and actually, Vladimir Bruginsky in the 1970s uh, thought about this in the context of instabilities in interferometers. Uh, but it turns out it's also something you can think about in the context of what will the signal to noise uh, be of your interferometer. Um, so you have that shot noise, which is an imprecision or uh, measurement thing, and sort of shot noise, you imagine little you know, balls of shot um, being poured out of some can and going uh, ping, ping, ping uh, on some drum or something. Uh, and if I also think about, well, if there's radiation pressure on these mirrors, and there's shot noise of the light, those two can actually combine um, to give a, a back action noise in the context of this type of measurement. And that sort of thinking um, was actually quite important in the development of uh, quantum optics and, and quantum measurement, uh, sort of historically. Uh, so these two things will combine uh, such that if you're at low light power, you'll be limited by the imprecision of your measurement, uh, but then eventually you'll have some back action uh, related to the uh, recoil of these uh, of the, of the photons. I can also sort of think about this as always in, in physics, I can think about things from, uh, from multiple ways. Uh, if I do sort of a back of the envelope calculation uh, associated with thinking about the mechanical object and thinking about it having um, position and momentum, and those are non-commuting observables, I can sort of apply what people think of as a Heisenberg microscope argument to, to again throw out the super back of the envelope thing. 
if I measure that object as some delta x at some time t, uh, the momentum will be uncertain uh, to something that is inversely proportional to that delta x, and there's an h bar in there. Uh, and so at some later time, I'll have my initial position uncertainty and then something that's inversely proportional to it. Uh, so that means there's some best that I can do uh, that people in this context often call the standard quantum limit, where you have to balance that imprecision and that back action. Uh, and this will be related to things like h bar and the mass um, and some characteristic uh, time in the problem. Um, so this is a little bit of a, of a funny uh, business. Uh, people call this the standard quantum limit, but there are other things called the standard quantum limit, so it's not really standard. Um, and it's uh, not really a limit either, depending upon which back of the envelope calculation you're doing. Um, but you sort of get the picture that you can estimate how well you can measure back action uh, becomes important. Um, and I can do all this just thinking about an interferometer. Okay. Uh, so if I look at this from uh, a sort of more concrete perspective and I plot out the spectral density of the uh, mechanical fluctuations that I'll see at a given frequency, I'm actually on mechanical resonance. Um, what I'll see is that my imprecision or shot noise will be beaten down uh, as I increase my measurement strength or light, um, but then the back action uh, will uh, start to arise at some point, and I get this uh, sweet spot in the middle, um, which via sort of general quantum amplifier uh, theory, I actually find that my added noise will be equal to my mechanical zero point level um, in this limit of measuring on mechanical resonance. And in this region over here where you have a lot of back action, um, you could think of that as a bad regime, but you could also think of it as a regime um, where the mechanics is really driven by quantum noise or shot noise. And so that's sort of an interesting place to be. And one of the questions we asked in our experiments is, can we get there, um, even with a micromechanical object? Uh, because even though these ideas have been thought about in the context of historical quantum optics, um, it's really hard to get there with a really big mirror. It's totally irrelevant for the initial LIGO uh, observations, although a number of the things we'll uh, be talking about um, actually uh, will in the future be, be relevant. Okay, so I'm going to stop there in the context of the super general intro and get a little bit more into our experiments and what they look like. Um, so what we do is work with these micro-mechanical objects where it's easier to get into this regime uh, where we can actually drive these objects with shot noise. Uh, we work with a dilution refrigerator where we can cool these objects down, uh, but also probe them with light. Uh, there are these silicon membrane drums. Uh, they really are a drum because there's a gigapascal of tensile stress. Uh, and they have megahertz resonance frequencies. Uh, this is what the experiment looks like. It's a bunch of optics. It sort of looks like an atomic laser cooling and trapping uh, experiment. Uh, and then we put our object, push on it with radiation pressure uh, inside of this little canister here. Uh, we can measure its Brownian motion, its thermal motion, and we can see that it's equilibrated to 80 millikelvin, even with a lot of light on it, uh, which is sort of a topic we could chat about later. Okay, uh, so what we're able to do is we're actually able to get into this regime uh, where we can have uh, this uh, radiation pressure and shot noise there. Uh, and we can actually have shot noise or the amplitude of the noise driving the mechanics. It can write back onto the cavity or the phase of the light. And in that way, we can actually uh, play around uh, with the light uh, in a sort of phase space picture where I'm looking at the optical quadratures now, uh, like the phase and the amplitude of the light, uh, I can squeeze that a bit, uh, and that squeezing allows me to measure better uh, in the quadrature where that distribution is smaller. Sort of a general idea. And the idea that I can use a mechanical object to do this is sort of intuitive based upon the description that I just made, and it has a historical name called ponder motive squeezing or mechanically mediated squeezing, you know, using a mirror to actually create uh, the squeezed light instead of a crystal, which would be sort of the normal way you would think about it. Uh, so this is actually um, some traces showing squeeze light in our particular apparatus. So we look at the photocurrent, and we're going to see it go below shot noise in a particular quadrature. And I'm not showing you the other quadrature. We can just look at one of them. And we're doing something that allows us to sort of uh, mix this amplitude and phase. And we can see uh, that the noise goes below one in a particular region. And as with usual sort of first quantum signatures, um, it's a little bit below something, but it's definitely below one. Um, there also, I'm going to sort of get into some of the uh, more 
devious features of this experiment, which is sometimes there's not just one mechanical mode we care about, um, but imposter mechanical modes. And that's what that little spike is there. And we'll talk about those a little bit more later. Uh, so these squeezing experiments are, are useful for us in these micromechanical quantum systems um, for a couple of reasons. Uh, one, they're really a very sort of a telling measure of the efficiency of how you get information out of your system. Uh, Any time that you try to, uh, it, you have a system where the squeeze light is being attenuated, um, you sort of put vacuum back in, uh, and your squeezing won't be as good. So it tells us how efficiently we're extracting information uh, about this mechanical object. And we can also think about using the squeezing uh, to make a better measurement. In fact, using the squeezing we get from the mechanics uh, to make a better measurement. And there we go, okay. Uh, and so we've done an experiment. I'll just show you uh, sort of one example of this. Uh, this is an experiment called variational readout, is sort of the historical name for it. And it's a way if you're measuring off mechanical resonance, uh, you can actually have a situation where the blue curve here uh, shows that your, uh, your signal to noise is improving, 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 and then getting worse, okay, as a function. Uh, of, in this case, the optical power in the measurement. Uh, but you can show that if you apply the squeezing that's actually created by the mechanics itself, uh, you can do a little bit better um, in some regions of, of parameter space. And this little bit better ends up being super important um, ultimately for certain types of measurements, um, precision measurements in particular. Uh, the sort of classic example is LIGO. These mechanical, micromechanical objects will not be useful for that. Uh, but the type of things that we can study, uh, look at here, um, are, are things that are definitely of, of relevance to the precision measurements, asking uh, which types of techniques um, are, are easy to apply or, or not um, in this context. Uh, and certainly in uh, advanced LIGO that is going on right now, um, they're using squeezing to get rid of noise in, in one of the quadratures. Uh, this type of idea here um, is something that I can do uh, even in the presence of, of radiation pressure noise uh, uh, as well as the imprecision noise. Okay, so that's a little bit of just sort of backdrop of making squeeze light with mirrors, um, with this mechanical interaction. I'm um, showing that the thermal noise in the mirrors doesn't get in the way, uh, and that we can really read it out in a, in a nice way. So this leads us um, into sort of the ideas of using these mechanical objects uh, a little bit more generally uh, as sort of parts of superconducting qubit hardware um, in some ways. Uh, and this is, a, as I said, a tricky problem of taking superconducting quantum bits and saying, well, what if I really wanted to take that state uh, that I made in the context of some superconducting circuit that's sitting in the bottom of a dilution refrigerator uh, and send it far away? What are different ways that I could do that? Uh, so it turns out what we're uh, trying to do in our experiment is we're taking our mechanical object shown by the green vibrating uh, object at the middle there. Uh, we're coupling it to an optical cavity uh, similar to what we were doing before uh, and measuring it very well. Uh, but simultaneously, we can couple it to a superconducting circuit. And this is a way in which mechanical objects could potentially play a sort of niche role uh, in the context of quantum systems because uh, there are not many cases where I could have something that talks very well uh, to both one regime and the other. Okay, and uh, what the green vibrating object is doing on the left side with the blue circuit is it's actually modulating the capacitance of the circuit. Uh, and in that way, it's a, it's a way that we couple ultimately to a superconducting qubit, which is somewhere off the page in this picture. Uh, and then cartoons, schematically, uh, what we're trying to do is there's some maybe Schrodinger cat state that is stuck in the bottom of a dilution refrigerator. Um, we, we would like to get that out into optical light. <laughs> Uh, so the type of experiment that you could imagine doing, um, but this has not been done um, in anyone's attempts to, uh, to make a transducer of this type, is I could imagine having um, two qubits, two superconducting qubits in particular, and this has been done with other types of qubits, to um, what we call electro-optic transducers that would uh, convert uh, to optical photons. Uh, and then we would do a sort of uh, heralded remote entanglement between those two objects. Uh, so that would be one of the goals, uh, and this is something that is uh, nascent in people's abilities. 
Okay, so back to our picture here of our uh, mechanical object and how we actually couple. And there are a number of requirements that we have to think about if we actually want this to be a transducer of quantum states. And some of those requirements are, I would want it to be bidirectional. I would want it to be capable of what I would call a unitary transformation um, between one of the ports and the other. Uh, I want it to be efficient. Uh, so if I had a, this is what I'm drawing there is a, is a beam splitter, uh, which sort of would let quantum noise in the other part. Uh, and I also wanted to have low added noise generally. If I add fluctuations that are going to look like my single photon that I'm trying to transduce, um, then that's going to be no good. Uh, so if I imagine that you know, before the start of this talk, I told you I'm going to use a megahertz acoustic vibration in order to do this, and that might have seemed like a, a sort of bad plan, right? Because uh, if you think back to the very early slides, uh, if I ask even a dilution refrigerator, will that object be thermally excited? Um, yes, it, it will. Uh, but hopefully I've sort of showed you experiments where effectively what we've done is we've been able to uh, measure that object and effectively couple it to light faster than it couples to its environment. And that's the key thing that I need to happen um, for this really to be a, a transducer of, of interest. Uh, and from that perspective, um, for those of you who might be familiar with sort of uh, typical uh, optical technologies, optical tables, I, you typically have these objects that I could, I could buy on eBay at telecom wavelengths. And uh, they consist of a nonlinear crystal like lithium niobate. Uh, and you can actually uh, take a microwave signal and sort of map it onto an optical signal in that way. Uh, and, but these type of devices, in terms of efficiency, in terms of doing exactly what you want in the context of a quantum state, uh, aren't quite there yet. Um, so you know, why is it that mechanical objects actually could be a useful thing in this context? Uh, I sort of think of these mechanical systems, and hopefully the squeeze light example was a really long way of telling you, um, that instead of taking a nonlinear crystal out of a drawer, I can actually use mechanical objects to effectively engineer a nonlinearity in my system. Uh, and in that way, we have flexibility in materials and geometries, in sizes of things. Uh, and this is in many groups, um, not just the work that I'll uh, tell you about today. Uh, there are mechanical objects from the gigahertz to the megahertz that people are trying to use as these effective nonlinear media uh, for quantum systems. Okay, um, so our actual device uh, looks a bit like a Frankenstein. Uh, so what we do is we have light um, that talks to one of these uh, vibrating membranes uh, that's shown in purple on the left figure there. Uh, and then we have some superconducting thin film that sits on top of that, um, which is a little bit uh, tricky. And we pick in particular niobium titanium nitride, uh, one of the um, quantum circuit uh, sort of options there. Uh, we make the spacing between two chips really small, and we couple both to the uh, motion optically uh, and electrically. And we use uh, super polished mirrors, which is sort of a trick of the trade of precision optical experiments, and where they're polished really well, so there's very little scattering of the optical photons. Because anytime you have a really high energy optical photon, it hits a superconducting thin film, you're going to create quasi particles and noise in that film. So that's one of the challenges of this problem. Uh, so these are some results um, showing that we can actually take uh, large coherent states and sort of a network analysis aspect uh, and actually convert them um, between uh, microwave and optical signals uh, with this mechanical device. Uh, and that it actually works very well in terms of, of efficiency. Uh, so what we're showing here on this plot uh, is, again, for um, any electrical engineers in the, in the audience. Uh, this is an S parameter. Uh, this allows us to know how much of you know, one signal is coming out of one port compared to the other port. This is the reflection of the signal off the microwave port. Uh, when the transducer is off, we get the gray line uh, uh, so that we do get a reflection. Uh, then we turn this transducer on, uh, which actually involves some uh, what we call pumps. And then what we see is that there's no longer a signal coming back at us on the electrical port. Instead, it is heading towards uh, the optical port of the, of the circuit. Uh, and in fact, doing that quite efficiently, uh, so about 50% efficient, 
And we see if we go in the other direction, um, it does the exact same thing. So it's really going back and forth. Uh, and in the optical domain, things are a little more complicated, but uh, some technical things there. Uh, this uh, transducer has a bandwidth of kilohertz scale. It can t operate continuously with the light on these objects. And most importantly, it's 50% efficient. Um, efficiency is very important uh, in quantum systems. Uh, so this is uh, sort of the, the best way that people can do it in terms of efficiency. What we spend a lot of our time uh, dealing with in the lab is that this uh, transducer still is a little bit noisy, a little bit too noisy um, to do uh, real quantum states, uh, but it's something that we're uh, working on and have improved by orders of magnitude over the last couple of years. Uh, so I won't bother you with those details, but they have a lot to do with uh, uh, different materials and, and lots of things that we uh, care about in these types of measurements. Um, but I'll show you something that's uh, a little bit more interesting, which is that we can actually hook a superconducting qubit, transmon qubit, um, uh, like are used in uh, a number of attempts to bring, uh, you know, build up quantum computers. And we're going to connect this to this transducer, and we're going to try to read out Rabi oscillations of the qubit um, through this uh, transduction, through this mechanical device, and see how well this works. Um, so I've shown probably my most complicated diagram of the talk. Uh, but basically, over here, on this side, um, we have a cavity that includes what pe people call a transmon qubit. Uh, it's tunable so that we can uh, couple it resonantly uh, to our other circuit over here. Uh, and then we send our signal uh, to our transducer, and we hope that on the optical domain we could read this out. Um, and in fact, we can see a qubit Rabi oscillation uh, when we do this measurement. Uh, and this is uh, nice in itself, and it can also allow us to calibrate the whole efficiency of our entire system. Uh, so one of the things that we were worried about uh, when we thought, well, we were, people are worried about many things in, in quantum systems in terms of uh, fidelities and how well things will, will work out. Uh, but for this particular problem, we're really talking about a sort of fundamental energy mismatch uh, between 10 gigahertz, uh, which is where people operate superconducting qubits, which are one of the possible uh, hardwares for a quantum computer, um, and optical photons, uh, which of course can propagate uh, for long distances and optical fibers. Um, exactly because they're higher energy. You know, at 300 terahertz, they're impervious to all the thermal stuff around us, um, but they have a high energy because of that. Um, so if any of them hit our superconducting thin film, I think I already said earlier, um, you will create um, quasi-particles within that, um, which will do many things. It could completely destroy the superconductivity, um, but even far below that, it can add noise, uh, which, is, which is equally a problem. Uh, so in these types of experiments, uh, we actually have 10 milliwatts of optical power um, circulating in our dilution refrigerator um, in this cavity uh, that could be scattering off a variety of things. And you could imagine uh, it could both hit the superconducting thin film that makes up that LC circuit over there, or it could ultimately uh, affect our, our superconducting qubit over here. <laughs> Um, and what we've been able to measure by having access to this qubit um, and being actually able to measure its coherence under different um, circumstances, uh, we can see that there's minimum disruption to the qubit. There's very low back action um, when we turn on this transducer, uh, which is, uh, again, uh, a very special property in the context of, of these types of experiments. Uh, and, and really due to, I think, something that I forgot to point out on one of these previous slides here, uh, which is that uh, there's actually a large separation uh, that I'm getting with this large mechanical object. I really can keep the light over here, and I can keep the superconducting circuit over here 200 microns apart. Uh, and these large-ish mechanical objects that you can see with your naked eye, okay, it's fun to do that, um, but it's also somewhat interesting and, and useful to be able to separate the, out these different sort of regimes. Okay, uh, so with that I wanted to spend, uh, and of course, yeah, if people have questions as we go along, feel free to ask, though I will have time at the end as well. Uh, but I wanted to spend some time uh, sort of talking a little bit about 
why in the first place can we pick out one particular mechanical mode and do something that I'm telling you, well, I'm laser cooling this particular mode um, while everything else is hot? Okay, that's, that's a sort of weird regime to think about. Coming from more of an atomic and optical background, that's sort of okay for me to think about all the time, but from a sort of solid state perspective, um, it can be a, a little bit funny. And so uh, let me tell you a little bit about how we isolate uh, mechanical modes. And in maybe a very exaggerated uh, perspective to start on some of our, our most uh, oddest objects that, that we make. Okay, so some of the things that we do in order to isolate mechanical motion uh, in one of these membrane drum-like objects are we take our thin film that's shown by the gold here, so the yellowish gold is silicon nitride, um, which is this material that we've been measuring as a mirror um, the entire time of the talk. And then the black parts there are empty space. And uh, then what we do is we put uh, a lattice of these masses uh, that are made of silicon nitride. Um, so like these little dots um, here and here. Uh, and that lattice makes a periodic array of masses and actually makes a band gap in the acoustic spectrum uh, associated with that material. And then we put a little defect in the center here. And that defect has a mechanical excitation um, that's shown by that red and blue pattern on the right there. And that object uh, vibrates at megahertz frequencies. Um, and it's effectively isolated in terms of its uh, acoustic radiation to the environment. Uh, it's also isolated in the sense that uh, the amount of bending of the material uh, that ult ultimately can lead to sort of putting heat into a material. Um, silicon nitride is amorphous, so it's actually not uh, a wonderful loss tangent material. Uh, actually is, is, is fairly small as well. On the right here, you can actually uh, see the mechanical spectra associated uh, with this particular object. Uh, and so what we're measuring is we're measuring uh, in the blue there uh, in the context of somewhere out just in the whole phononic crystal and not at the defect mode. And you can see that you have a forest of modes outside of the gray shaded region. And within the gray shaded region, um, which is this acoustic band gap, um, I, have, I have basically no modes. Uh, and then the, if I measure on the defect, I see one mode right there, um, which for this particular design is not in the center of the band gap. And there's actually, uh, we would like it to be, uh, but it, there's actually quite a bit of design work that goes on to uh, understand this. Uh, but when you do have one of these modes uh, within the band gap, it can have a very high quality factor. So it can um, store acoustic energy for, for a very long time. Uh, and it's really the way that we get these sort of imposter modes to go away. So we really can think about cooling uh, one particular mode uh, and not having sort of thermal noise of all the tails of the other objects uh, affecting what we are trying to see. Okay. All right. Um, so another thing that I, that I wanted to discuss in this context of we're going to use moving mirrors as quantum objects. Um, I've tried to show you that we can actually laser cool them down. Um, we can make squeeze light with them. They don't heat back up again. Um, we can try to use them as transducers. Uh, but you could actually imagine in the types of regimes that I've been talking about, um, actually, uh, I think Eric Cornell, who works at Gillen, is sort of a pioneer of cooling different things down that are atoms. Um, he's used to the idea that you can laser cool atoms, right? Because you know exactly where their transitions are, and you can put light on them and, and do what you want, um, and know what, you, what to expect. Um, for a material, you know, he always said, well, I'm going to stick a my finger in a laser beam. Why is it not going to get hot? Right? <laughs> uh, and there's a simple answer to that, right? Which is that you need to find some material where the absorption of the material is fairly small. Um, and, and the mirrors and the nitride that we use and in everything that I've, I've discussed, uh, that's been an important component. Um, but there's another important component, um, which is thinking as a sort of um, some, some recent work that we've been doing, uh, which is, let's say I had one of these very spindly membranes where different parts of it were very uh, thermally isolated. I can actually build up thermal gradients uh, within that context. And in this experiment, um, we intentionally tried to build up a, a thermal gradient. And then we can look at what different modes of this structure are doing uh, and you know, how do I think about their Brownian motion and which different parts of the, of the structure are they coupled to. Uh, so what we have here 
is a laser beam that heats up this part of the membrane right here. Uh, and it's, uh, you can see it's sort of very hottest right here, sort of even sort of near 1,000 Kelvin or so. Uh, so these are very thin films, uh, very isolated. And then I have a number of different modes of this structure. Uh, there's acoustics is, in the end, really complicated. Uh, these very thin membranes are a little easier to understand. And the green structures here are different modes that I could have. Um, the one on the left there is sort of this whole thing uh, moving up and down like this. Uh, the middle one there is a center defect mode, um, like in the picture on the other slide. And, and the uh, little bit on the right there is a uh, sort of hot defect mode. Uh, and these different structures actually uh, will end up showing their, their Brownian motion or their thermal motion uh, will be very different uh, and very different in a, in a somewhat interesting way. Um, so what you see actually uh, when you heat up in that place that I just pointed to is that the mode uh, that is over here on the left, which is this guy, um, actually doesn't heat up at all. And this guy over here uh, is heating up a lot. So it's really hot right in this region over here, uh, but this particular mode right here um, doesn't heat up. And uh, this is understood from a fairly simple perspective, which is there's a particular spatial place uh, where this particular mode is talking to its bath or environment. Uh, and this particular mode uh, here is talking to its bath or environment right near the edge, um, where actually the structure is very cold. And this guy is bending or talking to its environment um, in a region where it's really hot. Uh, and so when it comes to sort of thermal management in many cases, um, quantum systems are, are no exception in terms of needing to understand and control these type of things. Uh, and by measuring uh, the motion in different regions and understanding exactly where the dissipation is, and we can really differentiate these modes in, in sort of interesting ways. Okay. All right. So I wanted to give you a little bit of an outlook and perspective uh, as, as a last slide here. Um, and there's really this new field uh, where we're controlling vibrating mirrors and also electrodes. Okay, so I work on optical systems, so I was mostly talking about mirrors, um, but also electrical systems as well where you have vibrating objects. And they're really now in this quantum regime. And there's different things that we can think about doing them, sort of adding to this book of quantum hardware. Uh, I talked about this case where a mechanical object um, can mediate an interaction across the electromagnetic spectrum um, from microwave signals to, say, optical signals. Um, we can think about squeezing uh, using mechanical motion, so usually really using mechanical motion as another way of making a nonlinear material, uh, sort of a broad future in the context of uh, precision interferometers and in instruments. Uh, and then sort of hearkening back to some of those early pictures that I showed, um, there's this whole field that people are calling quantum acoustics, uh, which really has to do with actually piezoelectric materials uh, that are coupled to superconducting uh, qubits. So this would be another way that mechanical objects could sort of be an intermediary uh, between superconducting qubits, but on a chip. Um, you can imagine that there might be issues with uh, say, crosstalk um, between superconducting qubits in the context of uh, transmission lines. But a, actually an acoustic signal um, going along as, say, a surface acoustic wave on a chip uh, that has to be constrained to the chip and also has a much smaller wavelength uh, at 10 gigahertz frequencies could actually be something of interest. And this is something that's, that's being explored um, that has to do with mechanical objects in the quantum regime that I didn't discuss today. Uh, and then we have sensors that are enabled uh, by mechanical structures that are well coupled to light. Uh, the more and more we can understand these phononic crystal structures, isolating particular uh, mechanical degrees of freedom, um, the better and better that we can do this. Uh, and then another subject which is incredibly interesting, incredibly difficult to discuss uh, because it's a really fundamental physics that is, that is hard to predict. Um, but what we're really doing in these experiments as well is we're not making large quantum systems in the context of many degrees of freedom. We're making large quantum systems in terms of we are making them more massive. Like our things are 10 nanograms, uh, and you can imagine trying to push this to larger masses. Uh, and I would describe this as sort of generally expanding the envelope of mass in the context of, of quantum experiments. 
uh, which could be something interesting uh, to think about as well and is the uh, topic of uh, totally different talks. Um, there are some nice reviews uh, in Nature Physics recently, both on quantum acoustics and generally what you can do with uh, mechanical structures in the quantum regime. Okay, so with that, um, let me uh, thank different people that have been involved over the years, of course, uh, students and postdocs uh, who have done all the different work that I talked about here. Um, my collaborator, Conrad Leonard, um, my group does not actually uh, make superconducting qubits, but we collaborate with him to try to uh, ask if mechanical objects uh, can do this uh, type of physics. Um, and then also a thanks to sort of all of these types of experiments always involve a community of people and the community of people trying to take mechanical objects and ask what kind of cool quantum things could we do with them um, has been a, a fun community, so thanks to them as well. Um, okay, great, happy to answer any questions. <laughs>